Welcome to Zion Teacher Series. Today's teacher is Dr. Brian J. Bailey. Dr. Bailey is an internationally known Bible teacher and prolific author of over 35 books, which have been translated into more than 15 languages. In his 50-year ministry, he has traveled to over 100 countries, ministering at churches, Bible schools, pastors' conferences, leadership seminars, television, and radio. Dr. Bailey is currently the president of Zion Fellowship International and senior pastor of Zion Chapel, both of which are located in Waverly, New York, on top of Glory Hill. He is also the president of Zion Ministerial Institute and Zion University, which have over 30 Bible colleges around the world. In today's edition of Zion Teacher Series, we will look at the second book. Zion Teacher Series, we will look at the second book of our trilogy on the end times, the book of Daniel. Dr. Bailey will illuminate the mysteries of the dreams and visions Daniel had and show us how we can relate to them to today. We will also see the wonderful testimony of Daniel's faithfulness in the midst of the heathen nation of Babylon. So join with us now as we open our hearts to what the Lord wants to speak to us about the book of Daniel. Welcome. I'd like to welcome you to the Triology of the End Times. We have looked at the book of Revelation together, and I would now like to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Daniel. Daniel means God is judge, and we shall see, as we look into this marvelous book, God's judgments throughout all ages, God's decisions in the life of man and also nations. We open in chapter 1 to find Daniel, a captive in Babylon. We need a little background to understand this because I think it's very important indeed. It actually affects the whole of the book of Daniel and our understanding and interpretation of this book. Let me briefly run through the history of the children of Israel. They came up out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea to Mount Sinai and then through the wilderness into the Promised Land first under Moses, and then as they crossed over, they crossed over under Joshua. Then there was a period which called the Judges, and during that time every man did what was right in his own sight. There followed the period of the monarchy. It started with Saul, who was the first king of the United Kingdom of Israel, and then David, that great man, who was prophet, priest, and king. He was followed by his son Solomon, who was the wisest man who ever lived. And then, regretfully, because of Solomon's, shall I say, love of women, love of treasure, well, he turned from following God with all his heart, and God had to divide the kingdom between the north and the south. The north was called Israel, the ten tribes of Israel. The south was the kingdom of Judah. And the royal lineage continued ruling from Jerusalem over Judah. The other ten tribes very quickly went into idolatry, came under great judgments from God, with the result that in about 722 B.C., the northern tribes were taken away captive by the kings of Assyria. That left the southern kingdom, very small kingdom of Judah. The monarchy continued until basically 586. When at that time the Babylonians completely overran the city of Jerusalem and all of Judea, and took the people into captivity, into Babylon. Prior to that, there had been two other captivities, and the first one was in about 605 BC, at the time when King Jehoiakim was the king over Judah. There was a partial captivity at that time, and amongst those taken captive were four 
young teenagers, if I could say. And their names resound through history. They're called Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Four young friends who were very godly and known for their piety, their righteousness. Well, Nebuchadnezzar instituted a policy that has been followed by great empires from time immemorial, certainly from that time, if not prior to that time, that when a country acquires other nations, they realize that they have to train people from those nations to govern in a way that is acceptable to the, shall I say, mother country, if I could use those words. We certainly did it in England when uh, young people from our colonies were taken to Oxford and Cambridge and trained in the way of the English so that they in turn might take high government positions and responsibilities in their own country. Well, that was Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon's purpose too. He had to govern a large empire. Amongst those countries was the country of Judah. And so he gave the order that those of the royal seed, those who were capable, should be taken in for a three-year period and there trained so that they might acquire those gifts of government that were essential for the Babylonians to administer their empire. So, amongst the group of teenagers that were taken in, and they were taken in from uh, basically 14 to 17 years of age, something around that time, and uh, these um, children... Uh, and we give, have the qualifications here in verse 4, children in whom there was no blemish, but were well favored, skillful in all wisdom and understanding and knowledge and understanding science, and uh, such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace. In other words, you know, not everybody can stand in the presence of a king and know how to conduct himself or herself. And so these were the qualifications, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and the ability to understand science. And they were to be taught the uh, language of the Chaldeans. Now I just want to say a word or two about languages. You know, when you learn a language a foreign language, or even your own language well, you somehow imbibe the spirit of the people. And that is very important indeed, because in well understanding a language, you can well understand the people who speak that language. And so that was the purpose behind, obviously, uh, at least one of the purposes behind them being taught the Chaldean language. And then uh, the king appointed them food. They ate at his table, or shall I say a table set apart for these young people in the royal palace. And they had everything that the Babylonian empire could possibly accord them. In other words, the Babylonian empire was the most luxurious empire that has ever existed. Babylon was the most famed of all cities in the ancient world and luxury predominated. And these young men recorded anything that they might want. But uh, here we have these four young men and uh, they determined in their heart that they would not eat of the luxurious food that the king provided because that food had been offered up to heathen idols. And so they wanted to refuse it. And so they said to the 
governor who had been appointed to look after them, they asked permission that they might no longer eat that food, but just eat lentils. And uh, the governor said, well look, if you eat lentils and not the food provided by the king, well your faces are going to be different to the others. And I'm going to risk my own head if I permit that. Well, they said, prove us ten days. And after ten days, look upon our faces and see whether or not we are indeed better looking or at least as good looking as the others. And that he did and he perceived that their faces were indeed in very good health. And so he gave them their request. And so they ate lentils, they refused the luxuries of the king, they made a clear-cut distinction that they were serving their God, the only true God, the God of all flesh, the God of, who made heaven and earth. Well, you know, God responds, doesn't he? And uh, God, in turn, blessed these young men And we're told this, that in verse 17 of chapter 1, that these four children, God gave them knowledge, skill in all learning and wisdom. Daniel in particular had understanding in all visions and dreams. The book of Proverbs written by King Solomon, oh, hundreds of years beforehand, spoke of the value of wisdom. In fact, in one passage he records the teachings of his own father, King David, for he was brought up at the side of King David, David knowing full well he was going to be the king after him, and so he trained him very carefully. And uh, one of the things that David taught Solomon was this, He said it in Proverbs chapter 4. This is where Solomon records it. He said this, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, with all thy getting, get wisdom and get understanding. And she shall promote thee and be a crown of glory to thee. David was not satisfied with that admonition. He went on in subsequent chapters to say this, that all you can get cannot compare to wisdom. It's far greater in value than all the rubies and the gold and silver of this world. And so here was God giving to these young men the most precious things that anybody can have in this world. He was granting unto them knowledge, skill in all learning, and wisdom. What is wisdom? Why is wisdom so important? Well, wisdom is the ability to make right choices. Now, one of the things that God has always pointed out to me is this, that if I will make a right choice and walk in the path of that choice, then I will get the fruits and blessings of it. If I make a wrong choice, I'm going to get the sorrow and the grief and the weeping on that path. And so wisdom is the ability to make right choices. And you know, you consider today as you're listening to me, we are, you and I, we are what we are today because of choices that we have made in the past. Some of those regretfully have been wrong choices. And in one case in my life, I had to detour for one year to get back on the path that God had for me. And so, I know personally what it's like to make a wrong choice. Oh, it wasn't a choice of sin or anything like that. It was an error of judgment. Instead of going to one place, I went to another. I made a wrong choice. I don't think I prayed hard enough to get the mind of the Lord on it, but I made a wrong choice. It cost me one year of my life. 
One year is very precious. I don't say that God didn't make it up to me, but on the other hand, you know, I realize how important choices are. So that is in the sense of wisdom. Knowledge, of course, is so important. You know, a person with knowledge has strength. It doesn't matter in what area of expertise you are called to. The man of knowledge is sought out. He has strength and he has the key to, for the problems that come along. You know, we couldn't do anything with this program without the expertise of the wonderful technicians we have here. They know all about the uh, marvels of TV and the recording and so forth. And without them, we could not have this program. And so, you see, knowledge is power. And then, of course, looking on, he goes on to say, skill in all learning. You know, the ability to learn all the things that we need to in our particular sphere in this life. It's a wonderful gift. You know, some people have not the gift of learning. You can put them in a classroom and yet you can explain with the others a certain lecture, a certain truth, they cannot grasp it. Why? They don't have the skill to learn. They don't have the skill to learn. You can repeat and repeat the thing to them, they still can't do it. It's a gift from God. These men had it. Well, what I'm saying is this. You know, we've got to be very practical in our study of the book of Daniel. Not only to see the marvelous revelation that this man had, but also to learn things concerning his own life that we can apply to ours. Well, let us take wisdom, for example. Wisdom, we said, is the principal thing. Is it only given to Daniel? Is it only given to his three friends, the four of them? Is it only given to Solomon? No. The Apostle James says this, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who upbraideth not, and who will willingly give. You know, do we lack wisdom? Well, I need wisdom all the time to make choices concerning the responsibilities I have. And I'm constantly asking God, God give me wisdom. Cause me to make the right choice. And somehow when I pray like that, you know, it's as though my heart or my mind is illuminated and it's as though I've got the answer. Does it come of myself? No, it comes from God. So what I'm saying is this, that these beautiful blessings are not just reserved for the few, but the Apostle Paul, writing to the Ephesian church, says, I pray that God might give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Well, If Paul prayed that for the whole church, and surely the prayers of the Apostle Paul were answered, well, don't you think, too, that we, as children of God, can ask him, Lord, give me wisdom? You know, I was in research science before I became a Christian. When I became a Christian, I was still in research science for a time. And yet, I was so on fire for God that I spent my time, as much time as possible I could, studying God's word and also going to church. Well, you know, I got so caught up with these things that I forgot until the night before that I had an exam, a maths exam. I hadn't studied for it. I was in a terrible state of mind. Here I was, faced with a university exam. I had to go to the following day for mathematics and I hadn't prepared. I was so engulfed in the things of God. 
Well, the night of reckoning came. And I cried out to God. I said, oh God, forgive me. Forgive me for not having studied. Forgive me for having forgotten the exam. And, well, the maths book was something like this. And I prayed. And I opened this page. I read that. Prayed again. Opened another page and read that. And somehow I got through the book like that. Well, dear me. The next day at uh, the university... I looked at the questions and they covered the very material that I had looked at, seemingly oh hazar, but governed by God the night before. And undeserving as I was, I passed the exam and I learnt one thing. God knows the questions and God knows the answers. But you mustn't do that all the time, of course. But anyway, here we are this wisdom, knowledge, and learning. And I want to say this, and I, I, I will give you another illustration of this, to encourage you in the fact that God gives knowledge. A young girl in Switzerland came to me and uh, said, I'd like to be a pastor. Well, we prayed, and, and God indicated that he hadn't called her to be a pastor. And uh, so I said to her, Honey, just pray. And let us ask God what he wants for you to do. Well, she prayed and she came back and she said, you know, I feel God wants me to be a medical doctor. And I said, well, I think so too. But she said, there's a problem. She said, in Switzerland, before you can start your medical studies, we have to pass a Greek exam. And she said, I don't know any Greek. But I said, God does. When is your exam? This was about February. Uh, uh, her exam was in September. And I said, well, let's pray. And we prayed that God would help her with the Greek language. Knowing nothing, she started her course for the Greek and she ended up very high up the list in September. You see, God is able and the result was she became a medical doctor. Later on, she married a, a doctor. They have a fine family and wonderful practice in Switzerland. Well, there we are. I just want to encourage you. And now, as we come to the end of this uh, chapter, there's some other things that I want to look at with you. You see, Day, uh, Daniel was given understanding in all visions and dreams. And God does speak in visions and dreams. We see it throughout the Word of God. But he does today. How many of God's people are privileged to receive dreams, significant dreams, Dreams given by God that gives them understanding of certain situations or visions. But you know, it's not just the fact of getting a dream. You have to have the interpretation of, of the dream. And it's so important to go to those who, you know, like your pastor, to ask him, you know, say, well, look, pastor, I had a dream. How do you feel about it? And the pastor undoubtedly will get the witness and show you. Indeed, the significance of that dream for your life. Well, as we go on, we find that the king now brought in after three years. Three years seems to be the time of training in those days for government and universities, or colleges as we call it. And it's about the same period today in many respects. And he called them in. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar communed with them and amongst all the young people of his class, Daniel shone forth as well as did his three friends. He speaks much of King Nebuchadnezzar that he must have been a brilliant man in order to be able to ask the penetrating questions that have been necessary in order to be able to distinguish who could give the right answers, who was capable, and who would shine forth more than the others. And we are told that in all matters, in all matters of wisdom and understanding, that the king inquired of them, and the king must have given many penetrating questions to these 
young people. It shows the brilliance of the king himself. You know, you've got to know your subject if you're going to be an examiner. And the king must have been very brilliant indeed. And he was able to ask these penetrating questions that separated these four from the rest and he found them ten times better. Not only of the others in his class, but of these people who are called magicians and astrologers. Basically, a magician in this sense, like the Magi's of uh, the ones who came to Christ, who followed the star, they were scribes or learned people. And the astrologers, well, they were astronomers who foretold the future through the stars. In other words, very learned people, people with whom the king in those days would ask counsel for all the decisions that he would have to make. And so these teenagers were found to be better than all these learned men, his counselors in his kingdom. Remember someone else who was like that? The Lord Jesus Christ at the age of 12 was so full of the wisdom of God that he could ask and answer questions in the temple at the age of 12 and confound the doctors of the law. It's amazing. You know, the word of God said, out of the mouth of babes of suckling come forth words of wisdom. It's amazing what God can do. The young can be far advanced if they are filled with the wisdom of God, the understanding and learning of God. And I, I just want to, you know, just look at this chapter with you with these two thoughts in mind. First, we see the righteousness, the piety, the holiness of Daniel. And the word of God, the book of Proverbs says, with the holy there is understanding. Wisdom is, if I could say this, the blessing of the holy. And so the two go together. Revelation is linked to relationship. Relationship with the Lord brings revelation. The one who had the greatest revelation of all, the Apostle John, was the one nearest to the Lord Jesus Christ, Daniel, because of his holiness. And because of the fact he was one of the three most righteous men who ever lived, Noah, Daniel and Job enjoyed the blessings of revelation as we shall see in the succeeding chapters. So I want to encourage you too. Live a holy life. Pray. And you too will receive God's wisdom, knowledge and understanding that will enable you to live a very fruitful and satisfying life. God bless you.